Um, we do have, based on time, because I'm going to be talking a little bit slower then, um, I will most likely skip some of the videos, but there is a portion uh, looking at facts and myths specifically Beautiful. um, regarding more to like parents too, because there is like some cases where it's like, oh, I'm a bad parent or like, oh, they're, they live with their dad. So they got it from there. And it's like, Oh, no, it's like yeah. a genetic thing. Yeah. Yeah, no, So I think that's good. yeah. So Cool. there is um some aspects of that. And then I'll also kind of go a little bit into detail on what the diagnosis process looks like, because they can't just go to therapy and like, boom, you have ADHD. It's like a really long process to Of diagnose course. it. Yeah, yeah, let's talk about that. Okay, um, well, thank you, uh, all of our families who are here with us today. Um, we are going to get started just about a minute or so. You all just received the text blast letting you know about this or reminding you about this um, conversation that we're going to have. I know it's something that's on a lot of our uh, parents' minds, something that, you know, even, you know, myself, I've been, I've been told, Alejandro, have you ever gotten diagnosed with ADHD? We think you have ADHD, right? And so it's something that people just kind of throw out and talk about. So we decided um, to partner with CareSpace, thank you, to Ines, for being here, to bring to you a presentation on the facts and the myths of ADHD. Uh, as you see the title page here, not just in children, but just across the, the lifespan. So who knows, uh, maybe Ines will uh, help me in, in, my, <laughs> in my struggles and my path as well. I want to uh, remind our families that if you need this information in Spanish, on the bottom portion of your screen, you should see the option um, to change from English to Spanish. Si necesita esta información en español, Ya puede cambiar, está aquí apoyándonos Yvonne, uh, Yvonne nuestra intérprete de nuestro distrito escolar. Puede cambiar el idioma de inglés a español en la parte inferior de su pantalla donde dice Interpretation. Uh, si no ve Interpretation, puede cambiar el idioma por la herramienta que dice More o Más. Ya puede cambiar el idioma de inglés a español. Muchas gracias, Yvonne, por estar aquí. Um, parents, thank you so much for being here. We know it's five o'clock. It's getting a little darker sooner. There's a million things that you could be doing, uh, but thank you for spending an hour with us uh, to learn about how to support your child uh, through uh, this. We have our um, partner with uh, RCOE, Ines. Would you mind introducing yourself? So hello everyone, my name is Ines. Um, I'm pretty sure you see on the title screen two names. Those are my colleagues. They're the ones who came up with the presentation and the information, but a little bit about myself. I am Ines Castillo. I work with CareSpace as a marriage family therapy trainee. That means I see clients of all ages, but I do have experience for about two years working with community schools and really working with kids as their behavioral health therapists. Beautiful, thank you. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I'll be there in a minute. Okay, very excited to celebrate. <laughs> um, so, uh, sorry, that kind of distracted me. Um, so as you see, um, parents, this is a, um, a high caliber presentation, something that's being put out by Riverside Latino Commission on Alcohol and Drug Abuse Services, but also in partnership with the Riverside County Office of Education. Uh, you know that I always like to start off just by thanking you for being here. Um, we know that we have so many great supports that we have in Albert Unified School District, so many great teachers, fantastic programs, but we can't do it alone. We can't do it without you. So on behalf of the Board of Education and the entire staff here at Albert Unified School District, thank you so much um, for your partnership. And Yvonne, I realized halfway through that that I was speaking very fast. I'm gonna to try to be a little slower. Thank you for your interpretation. Uh, Ines, you're up. Okay, so we're going to be talking about ADHD, we're going to be looking at some facts and myths, and really how it impacts the lifespan as a whole. So we do have an agenda, we're going to start by defining it, looking at the diagnosis, right? So how do you get that diagnosis? And what's the process like? We're also going to look a little bit at data, what's it look like in childhood and adulthood, the types of treatment that there could be, um, and then just kind of following off on some facts and some myths. So starting off with what is ADHD per the CDC, it is Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. Back in the day, they used to call it ADD, but now they actually split it. So when they split it, there's actually three types, right? There's going to be one, which is for inattentive presentation. That's going to mean it's really hard for the person to just pay attention to something. 
And the other one is going to be the hyperactivity one. That's the one where it looks like kids are bouncing off the walls. Um, there's also a third one, which is combined. That means you have both of them. It's hard for you to pay attention, and it's also kind of hard for you to sit still. The reason ADHD is a neurological or a neurodevelopmental disorder, it basically means it's all right here in the brain. So you have one little piece of the brain that's kind of telling everyone what to do. They're the leader. And they're like, hey, I need you to go, and I need you to like tell my memory like to get this because I need to go find it. And then the leader starts to go and they start to go. And then they're like, oh, hey, I see the person that controls sound. How are you? What are you doing? What are you up to? Wait, I was supposed to do something. I forgot what I was supposed to do. So in return, it ends up making it really hard for the person to pay attention to things because within their brain, the little connectors, the neurons, they're not connecting to where they're supposed to be. They kind of bounce around and they kind of like to visit all the other ones and catch up and, you know, be friends, um, which is typically what we see. Hence the, the reason why it's neurodevelopmental. It's all kind of happening in the brain. So then, Ines, it's not just, um, as you mentioned, you said kind of bouncing off the walls. It's not just this hyperactivity. It's also having trouble like focusing on one task. Yeah. So some people have it more. We call it somatosensory, which if I go back, somatosensory is the way that you feel it in your body. That's going to be the hyperactivity. Those are going to be the people that are kind of fidgety. They need a lot of movement. They need to kind of feel like they're in control of their body or doing something. And again, it's with the neurons. The neurons might be visiting the parts of the body that like to move. They might be visiting like the sensors in your hands or the ones that like to, you know, kind of mess with your eye. Where with inattentive, those neurons might be visiting other parts of neurons that are kind of like, oh, I really need to make sure I take out the trash when I get home because my mom told me to. Ooh, trash. This other day I was watching this movie that had like a really cool trash can in it. Oh, I should go on Amazon. Oh, you know what? I'm on Amazon. Let me see if there's like any movies I could watch. That's yeah. going to be more inattentive presenting where hyper is going to be more in the body. Inattentive is going to be more in like the head. Yeah. That's very relatable. You, you, you got me. I'm, I'm hooked. Let's go. So, yeah. Also, um, in terms of the diagnostics, I'm going to go a little bit into it. It is really hard to diagnose children or anyone kind of below the age of, I would say 16. Um, you can't just walk into a therapy office and be like, I have ADHD and the therapist is like, eh, yeah, you do. Right. Um, I'm going to go more in depth into that. So that parents are also kind of aware of what the process looks like, but for people who are 16 years or older, they have to present with six symptoms. If you're older than 17, you just need five. So adults technically just need five. Um, they also have to be symptoms that happen before the age of 12. The reason why it's 12 is because this tends to be the sweet spot for puberty. So a lot of the times when we have the really little ones, like the eight to nine year olds, we typically don't diagnose just because it could be a developmental thing. They could just be outgrowing or kind of getting used to, you know, playtime, things like that. Um, the other really important one, symptoms have to be present in multiple areas. So for example, at home, at school, at work, um, if kids are like involved in, let's say sports or any extracurricular activities, they have to be there too. So again, I'll go a little bit more in depth, but we are going to focus a little bit on what each one really looks like specifically. So again, inattentive presentation, we tend to see this one with girls a little bit more than with boys, even though they're still pretty equal. But this one is going to be the one where it's really hard for the person to concentrate. This is also going to be the one where if you guys ever have kids and you're directly talking to them and making eye contact and the child just kind of starts to do this and they're not being defiant, they're just not paying attention. They're just somewhere else. They got distracted. Um, this person is also going to have a lot of trouble organizing things. So this could also be the person where they dump out their backpack and everything is a mess and just everywhere. And you're like, oh, what's going on? And they're like, no, I can find it. Right. Um, this person also tends to make a lot of careless mistakes in schoolwork where they might kind of think, oh, yeah, I'm going to fix it. And then they completely forget and move on to something else. Doesn't um, correct it. From what I've seen in schools, this is also the child where they do complete the homework. It's crumpled in their backpack, but they just never turn it in. So they have it done. They have the intention to turn it in. They just never did. Hence the poor grades. It's not from them not doing it. It's from them just not turning it in, right? So because of this, this is looking at this person often loses things. They often misplace things. They're easily distracted or they're just forgetful. They just tend to forget daily tasks. 
So even though this person might have a routine by getting up every morning, going to school, getting breakfast, they still might forget aspects within that specific routine. I do see some comments. Okay, in the chat. Okay, cool. So with hyperactivity impulsive, again, we tend to see this one more with boys, or at least the diagnosis is a lot higher with boys, just because of cultural norms as well. With boys, we tend to encourage a lot more sports, a lot more physical activity. So it's a lot more easier for us to see that in boys as well. Um, with this one, it's going to be a lot of fidgeting with hands, see, you know, kind of squirming around, moving around. This one is also going to be the type of person that just kind of gets up and walks out, out of nowhere. They need to move. They need to be in movement. Um, depending on the child, again, if they're the really younger ages from like eight to nine and they're kind of climbing stuff because it looks really cool and they're playing and they're like, I'm going to be a dragon and climb up these walls. That's completely normal. But if we have a 15 year old or a 16 year old boy doing that, then that's going to be where some concerns are raised because it's not within the developmental age range. Oh. So for this one as well, um, it's a lot of talking excessively. It's a lot of interrupting other people they kind of have trouble waiting for their turn. So this person might come off as rude as well. They might come off as not having a lot of empathy for other people and what they're kind of talking about, um, as well as being very blunt when they answer. So even though the question hasn't been fully complete, if you kind of ask them, oh, hey, how's your day? They might be like, oh, I'm fine. Oh, okay, you're fine? Yeah, 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 I'm fine. And then it's followed up by a really long stream of conversation, right? Yeah, Miss, I'm fine. And like, actually this weekend, like we went down to the lake and it was like really cool. And like, and like my dad and like, oh, actually Miss, like what's over there? Oh, oh, Miss, is this new? Can we play with it? Yeah, like, have you ever played Uno, Miss? Can we play Uno? It's because I'm really bored. So that's going to be a little bit more of the hyperactivity presenting one in relation to like speech. And Ines, uh, we did get a question in the chat from Myra. Thank you, Myra. What if uh, these symptoms are present only at home and other places, but not necessarily at school? Okay, yeah, that's a good one. So when they're only present at home, and I know this because this is what I typically work with as well. A lot of the times I get parents who come in and they're like, my child has ADHD and I see none of the symptoms in the office. The child is like perfect. They're a sweet little angel and we have a great therapy session. But the second parent steps into session, that's when the child is bouncing off the walls. They're being defiant. They don't want to listen. So when you start to see aspects like that, you actually have to switch the parenting style. So what we typically recommend, um, it's called PICT family training. And what it is, it's you ignore the unwanted behaviors. So for example, we do this for a couple of reasons. Let me go into why we do this. Usually children will do things to grab our attention and that attention is the way that they feel loved and seen, right? So a child will start to say, if I jump on that wall and I kind of dangle myself from the staircase, my mom is going to go, oh my God, get down from there. And she's going to be really concerned and I'm going to get her attention. And that's how I know she cares. she loves me. She cares about me, right? So as, as a parent, you're like, oh my God, please get down, please, right? So what you start to do with those um parenting styles or change in parenting styles is you ignore that unwanted behavior you just turn around you walk away child typically will act out even more because this is how they get your attention so they're going to go to extremes it's going to be really stressful for the parent but in order to kind of start to compensate from that when they do calm down they get off from the stairs and they're like downstairs now and they're just kind of like where were you right like that's when you follow up with reassurance and praise so that's when you start to go wow, I really liked how you calmed down. You know, you worked really hard in order to get down from there and just be so calm right here. And you start to reinforce with the behavior that you want to see. Mm -hmm. um, what we tell parents is it's going to get worse before it gets better. Also within my office too, when parents are doing these parenting skills, I see it in the office too, where I have kids jump off from chairs and I'm kind of like, oh, I'm like, please get down from there. I could lose like my, I could lose my job if you get hurt, right? But I also have to partake and ignore the behavior. When child comes down, I also encourage and I say, you know, thank you for being so calm. You worked really hard on calming yourself down. So if it's one of those cases where it's only in the home, chances are parenting um, style has to be switched a little bit just to kind of decrease some of the negative behaviors and increase the positive behaviors with positive reinforcement. Got it. Thank you. Um, and then if parents would like to get a little bit more in depth or maybe specific uh, with their own child and their own situations, 
um, would you recommend that they reach out to their like health insurance, uh, mental health support? How can they get um, this sort of um, attention? Yeah, so they could do it um, if they do have insurance and they have a medical provider that offers the counseling services for children specifically, they could go ahead and get in contact with like a therapist through their insurance. Um, if the school has a school based counselor, they could get in touch with them as well. Um, looking at the way that's going to work in order to, again, diagnose ADHD, there's a lot of steps that need to be taken. It's not just a quick diagnosis. So, for example, if a parent brings the child to me as a therapist, I might not see any symptoms. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do an assessment, which is like a test. So then parents do a home assessment and then teachers, I would give them a, a little pamphlet. Teachers also fill out an assessment. I do my own assessment. So that's three different tests looking at child's behaviors. So for example, with one of my clients um, currently, I didn't see any ADHD um, from the teacher's report. There's no ADHD going on, no disruption in class. So it's mainly just in the home. So now as a clinician, I have to look at what's going on in the home that would kind of create all of these symptoms for the child. Got it, got mm -hmm. it. That, that does make sense, thank you. Uh, and we received one uh, other question in Spanish. It says, what happens is that uh, he's very, intelligent, uh, but he moves around a lot and he's five years old. And I think you already uh, addressed that. Um, and you said that a lot of these um, behaviors are really developmentally appropriate. A five-year-old probably is going to jump around and move around a lot. But um, if you keep seeing this until he's, uh, what in this, like in his teenage years, uh, is that then yeah. the cause for alarm? Yeah, for boys specifically, it tends to be up until they're 14, 15. So the eighth grade to freshman high school, that's when they start to calm down with a lot of the developmental aspects of like the hyperactivity. Um, for girls, it tends to be around 12. So a little bit later, but that's just because the maturation level is a little bit different. But again, so for example, um, as a clinician, if they're like six, if they're eight, we don't really assess for ADHD just because it could be developmental. So it's just part of them like wanting to play or wanting to go do something. Um, something I always tell parents is, you know, like, oh, no quieren, no quieren hacer su tarea, no quieren limpiar. Like they don't want to do their homework. They don't want to do their chores. And I'm like, okay, when you were eight, did you <laughs> like to do your chores? No. Okay. Girl, I'm 37. I don't like to do my chores even still. Yeah. And I'm like, well, they're eight. They want to be outside and play. You know, they don't, they don't want to sleep. Yeah. They're like, yeah. They're like, that's a responsibility. I'm like, yeah, but they're eight. Yeah, that's true. That's true. It's also uh, really looking at age. Yeah, I guess it's developmental. And then also the severity of it. I mean, yes, it's developmentally appropriate for a child of that age to be really active. But if it gets too severe, then I think that might be a cause for alarm. We have a, a, a pretty interesting question from somebody who just said iPhone. How long has ADHD been around? I know it seems like a lot of kids have it these days, but has it always been around? Yeah, so before, um, so the DSM-5, which is what we use to look at our diagnosis, has been around since I want to say the 1940s, 50s. Um, it has been updated, I think, five times. Um, in the first three, yeah, so three, three books ago, and it was under ADD, which is Attentive Disorder, Attention, De Attention Deficit Disorder. There we go. Yeah. But now they actually kind of we did it so that the criteria is actually harder to get the diagnosis for that same reason, because a lot of parents, um, what was happening is eight-year-olds were kind of said to have ADHD. They would be put on medication. Turns out, again, they would outgrow that diagnosis when they were older and they would kind of calm down and stabilize. So now that's why the process is a lot harder to get that diagnosis. So uh -huh. Um, it's kind of like with depression and anxiety, you hear a lot of people say those key terms, oh, I have depression, I have anxiety, but it's really covering up other feelings. So sadness, worry, same with ADD, it's just covering up boredom. Got it. Thank you. And it sounds like what you're going to talk about now, or the causes of ADHD you might go into shedding a little bit of light. So I'll let you uh, keep going. Thank you, Ines. Yeah, so one of the biggest causes that we tend to see is genetics. Um, when we do have someone who has the diagnosis, chances are a parent is in my office and they're like, you know what, their older brother is just like this. Or I'll have moms who are like, oh, actually, his dad is exactly like that. His dad can't stay still. Like his dad has to be doing something all the time. That's weird. And it's like, oh, okay, I know where they get it from now, right? 
So chances are it's genetics. Um, genetics, depending on the environment that the person is in, going into environmental factors, depending on the environment that that person is in, is dictated by their genetics. So for example, if um, I was to be born in a completely different country, in a different um, social like area, maybe let's say I was born a millionaire, right? Maybe my genetics wouldn't have presented with ADHD, but if I was born completely other country and I was dirt poor, maybe they would have shown up because of my levels of stress with genetics, right? So it really depends on the environment and where you live. The other one too, for a really long time, they did find research that linked to lead found in like really older buildings or paint to contribute to aspects of ADHD. And again, going into developmental problems, if you have a really small child that has been in a home with lead paint, right, or let's say their entire adolescence up until they're 16, that would have a really big contribution on them probably developing this kind of disorder. Um, so just kind of little things to keep in mind. But for the most part, it tends to be genetics and how your genetics react to your environment. So again, just some risk factors. If you have relatives, parents, siblings with ADHD, chances are that child or that other relative might have it. Um, another risk factor is if the mother, biological mother, um, smoked, drank, or used alcohol during pregnancy, um, exposed to toxins like lead as a child, and being born prematurely, prematurely in the sense of maybe some of the neurons didn't finish connecting the way that they need to. So when they try to communicate to each other, they kind of bounce a little bit. Um, for the sake of time, I'm going to skip this one. I'm also going to skip some of the videos just so that I have some time to answer some questions. Thank you, Ines. And then just um, for community, we received a couple of questions in the chat saying, uh, can we get a copy of the slides? A copy of the slides are really helpful. Uh, or would you be okay with uh, that, Ines, me sharing these slides out? Yeah. Beautiful. Okay. So um, families, um, on our family engagement page, I'll be uploading these um, the, the recording and then the presentation, but then I'll also send it out through Parents Square. Thank you, Ines. Mm -hmm. So in terms of ADHD in adulthood, thinking of how, let's say my child does have ADHD and how are they going to function into adulthood, right? It's looking at them probably making impulsive decisions, poor management skills, right? Having a hot temper. The hot temper actually comes from feeling like you're not understood or also feeling like you constantly have to fight yourself, especially in your head with, I really want to do this one thing. And two seconds later, I'm doing something completely different. And now I'm frustrated at myself. I'm mad at myself. So hot temper can also be very inward, not outward. Um, also like a low frequency or a low tolerance. Again, it's from just being constantly tired of feeling like oh, I can't do anything right. Uh, so these are, again, just some of the symptoms in adulthood. For the symptoms, they must have started in childhood, again, at the age of 12 or earlier. And again, if they start, let's say, at the age of six, and you wait it out, you wait it out, and they continue to persist at the age of 12 or older, then there is a chance that could be ADHD. Especially if you went ahead and you did the process where you did the assessment as a parent, you did the assessment with the school, and another clinician also agreed. So you have three people agreeing on the diagnosis then chances are that, yes, it is ADHD. Um, so again, everyday tasks are going to be really challenging. Imagine being an adult, and when you wake up in the morning, you, you get your kids ready, right? What's What are some of the things that you would probably disturb your normal functioning, right? If I'm getting up, oh, I have to do the dishes. Oh, wait, I need to wake them up. Okay, I woke them up. I put pants on them. Oh, actually, I need to get their lunch ready. Let me go get their lunch ready. And then I see my child walk in with no shoes, and I'm like, Where's your shoes? Where's your shirt? Oh, you know what? Let me, oh, actually your hair's really messed up. Let me like clean your hair. Okay. Are you ready to go? Wait, you don't have shoes on. So again, as an adult, that gets really draining, right? Um, in terms of treatment, treatment is going to be similar to children. So there's a couple options. There's the option of medication. There's the option of um, going to therapy and doing what we call CBT, which is behavioral therapy. So that's changing the way that you outwardly interact um, in order to kind of compensate some of the, what seems like chaos going on, right? So with CBT, we'll do lists. We'll do things that are easy to check off. If you know that you get distracted, for example, with my ADHD people, what I tell them to do is don't put things in a drawer 
or in a cabinet that you can't see because you'll lose it and you'll forget that it's there. So keep things out in the open where you could just quick glance, oh, it's right there, grab it, right? So there's a lot of kind of like tips and tricks to navigate some of these things in adulthood, but that would be more catering it to personal preference and with the help of like a therapist. So going into some of the treatments, right, we do have, I personally use a lot of CBT, which is looking at the behavioral. So again, with CBT, we actually talked about this one, the PCIT parenting. When you notice that it's only in the home, but your child is a perfect little angel with their therapist at school, with their friends, and it seems like they only like to fight you, right? This is a really big example on using the PCIT skills. So parents using that um, coping skill to ignore the unwanted behaviors. If your child is throwing themselves off the stairs, just ignore it. Don't go save them, right? Once they calm down and they're like, where's my love? Where's my affection? Why aren't you worried about my well-being, right? That's when you come in and you're like, oh, thank you for being so calm. Thank you for, for sitting so quietly, right? Um, with this one too, what we tend to see if they're siblings, right? Sibling one, sibling two, and they're eating, and one of them is eating really nice and quietly. And you're like, oh, thank you for eating so quietly. I really appreciate you. And the other one gets really mad. They start chewing really loud, trying to get your attention. You ignore it. You ignore it, you ignore it, you ignore it. And then when they calm down and they're like, oh, they're not paying attention to me. And I chewed really loud and they're just like, right? That's when you go in and you do, oh, thank you for chewing so quietly. I really appreciate that, right? So with siblings, it works too. In terms of skills training, this is one of the ones that we tend to really emphasize on um, learning how to communicate what they feel, um, also using what we call a feeling wheel. So we use I statements, right? So I feel exhausted. I feel confused. A lot of the times when you try to give a child with ADHD directions, they're going to just wander off. So what we tell them to do is look them right in the, in the face and say, can you do this? And then you have them repeat it to you. Can I go get you a glass of water? Yes. Can you go get me a glass of water? Yes. Okay. And you keep the instructions very small, very simple, one instruction at a time. So not a list, just one thing at a time. Can you get me water? And then when they come back with the water, can you set it on the table? Set it on the table. So keep it very short, very simple, very minimal. In terms of medications, that is going to be something to talk to the healthcare provider and a psychiatrist. Um, from my perspective as a therapists, we have no input on medication, and that's completely up to parents. So if parents would like medication, that's going to be up to their judgment. And if parents decide, I don't want medication, also up to their judgment. As a therapist, all we do is offer the skills for parents and for the children to kind of navigate some of the symptoms. So again, just looking at some of the PCIT, so this is the one that I was referring to. Originally, the way it was done is it's in a two-way mirror. So you have parent and child on their own. Therapist has a little microphone. They're kind of talking into a little earpiece that parent hears, and they kind of instruct parent, like, okay, you they're starting to cry. Walk to the door and ignore it. Okay, child, calm down. Go back to child and praise them. Tell them how nicely they're sitting or something. So that's the one that we typically tend to do, and it works really well for children between the ages of two to seven, but it also works really well with teenagers, surprisingly. Gosh, this, um, this I understand and I hear what you're saying, but just as, as a parent, I think that uh, that must be really hard uh, to see something that you know is not okay for your child to do and try to ignore it. Um, what are, um, do you have any recommendations on just making this, more, um, I guess, I don't know if easy is the right word for our parents, but you know, you mentioned, for example, a, a child standing on a chair or climbing up a wall. Um, you know, if, if I saw that as a, as a dad, I'd be like, like, get down, right? Uh, and, I, and I think a lot, of our, a lot of our parents might, you know, react to saying, because it's normal, right? We want to make sure that their kids are being safe. How do you navigate or straddle that line between ignoring the behavior, but also addressing the behavior. So from, again, a clinical perspective, chances are a child already knows that you're going to tell them, be careful, get down. That's why they're doing it. So they're on that chair because they know you're going to tell them, be careful. So to the child that's saying, my parent is going to show that they love me and that they worry about me when I get on this chair and I like threaten to jump off my chair. And that's how I'm going to receive my love. 
So it's really changing that dynamic. And it's really hard, again, as a therapist, seeing the, that my child on like the chair. And I was just like, I was like, what do I do? Like, what if they hurt themselves? And I'm like the therapist in the office, right? But it is that thing where like, you just have to like, really hone in and just kind of like stand your ground. Um, another thing too, that we often tell parents is consequences. So for example, setting a limit. If you don't get down in two minutes, mm -hmm. I'm going to take away or um, for mom specifically, like we'll say, if you don't get down from the chair in two minutes, I'm not going to make your favorite food tonight. Mm -hmm. And child, chances are they're going to stay there. They're not going to listen the first time. They're going to push your limits to see if you're really, you know, if you're really going to go through with it. Um, so at that point, you know, mom, you said your consequences don't make their dinner tonight. And that's typically how it also goes. So if at some point it does become where you are really concerned, you set a consequence. Get yeah. down in two minutes and you kind of give them a choice, right? A little bit, you know, get down in two to three minutes or I'm going to do X, Y, and Z. Yeah. So it could be a consequence like I'm going to take away your phone. I'm not going to like cook your favorite dinner tonight. Um, for my parents who are stay-at-home moms, a lot of the times they'll kind of be like, I'm not going to wash your favorite clothes. Like you're going to wear the clothes that you don't like to wear. And they're like, no, I hate it. Like, I hate those shoes. And it's like, Entonces, bajate, right? Like, get down. Um, so kind of setting consequences like that tends to work. Like I said, chances are the first time they're not going to listen. They're going to really push you to see if you're really about your word. But once they see it after the first or second time, they're going to start to get down on their own. Yeah. yeah. And, and I also want to um, highlight that we have some parents commenting on, on that. I think maybe... Uh -huh giving me some support. So thank you to everybody. Myra says it takes a lot of patience and a lot of practice. Um, Yil is, is said something very interesting. Uh, it's like they're seeking dopamine, but in a negative way. That's true. A lot of the time, as Ines said, they're just seeking that attention. They want to see that you love them. And sometimes, you know, kids are learning how to get that attention and they do it in a negative way. And then Evelyn says, as a parent with a kid on the spectrum, it's hard to learn those strategies, but they work and following through is very important. Thank you to everybody. Yeah, another thing too, in regards to the dopamine, um, kids at a certain developmental age can't tell the difference between adrenaline and cortisol. Cortisol is the stress that we feel in our bodies. They can't really tell the difference between those two. So a lot of the times they kind of like to be in that environment of stress because to them it feels very exciting and it feels very like, oh, I'm on a roller coaster. Um, but again, because they can't really differentiate cortisol with stress from adrenaline. <laughs> so in terms of interventions in the home, I did see someone comment that with a child on the spectrum, these things also work as well. Something that, again, we really emphasize is maintaining structure and kind of creating a routine. So with a lot of my clients is um, routine in the sense of, okay, you have a desk at home, only keep the really important things outside that you need every day, right? So this client, we have her skincare, so like moisturizer, sunscreen, mascara. That's the most important thing that she kind of can't go outside the house without. Um, she's like 15. So for her, that's like the most important part. She needs to see it every day, to wear it every day. So she has to keep it outside. With her, if she has anything in a drawer, she'll forget that it's there. She might buy something else. And then she gets home, she opens the drawer. Oh, I have like five of these I completely forgot. So also setting and creating a routine. So for example, only buying clear bins, keeping things outside, making sure to maybe take pictures of what you have so that you could go back and reference them. Um, for parents, a lot of the times it's also going to look like having um, those whiteboards so that child could cross off one thing, one by one by one. So the same way that you're doing the simple instructions of, can you go give me water? Okay, thank you. Can you go set it down? Thank you so much. Same thing on a whiteboard. Also make it so that they could just like cross it off, redo it, right? Um, for detailed lists, again, we don't recommend detailed lists. Just very simple, like make bed, sweep, things like that. Um, and more importantly, create a reward system. So the same way that when we're doing the consequences, we follow up by praising them. Same thing, but with a reward system, you know. So if during the week you see, you know, you've been really good at this, you've turned in your homework, you've done it on time. Do you want to play together? Do you want to do something? And trying to figure out what reward system works for them. Yeah, we used to have, uh, when I was a principal at an elementary school, we had sticker charts for students. And a lot of the times, um, you know, when I, especially as I was new to these reward systems, 
I would say, why are we rewarding students for doing what they should be doing anyways, right? But the students wasn't there yet, wasn't able to regulate themselves yet. So we would give them a sticker for, great, you know, um, I was an elementary school principal. So in the kindergarten class, we had stickers for, you sat down in your chair, boom. You completed an assignment, boom, right? You cleaned up your space, boom. And then after, you know, it depends on the age and, and the particular child, but after three stickers, after five stickers, then they would get some sort of reward. And a lot of the times the rewards were um, determined with the child. Like, did they want um, like a positive phone call home? Did they want time with a friend? Did they want, um, I don't know, like a little trinket or something? Uh, and that was very helpful. So it, it turned this skeptic this uh, into a convert. And it, and it made it so that I understood the value of that. But it is, it is hard um, to yeah. kind of wrap our own adult minds around that. Yeah, a lot of the things as well, or a lot of the struggles that I see with parents is they actually struggle to praise, um, which is, again, as a therapist, I usually have them in session with me for about three sessions, just so that they could see and hear an example of it, and they could kind of practice it on their own. But I do see that th tends to be a really big struggle. I see that it's a really big struggle with dads, specifically, mm -hmm. where it's like, I don't want to praise my child because then I'm spoiling them. And it's also that idea that you have to think, you know, you're not spoiling them. You're encouraging the behaviors that you as a parent want them to have. And if you don't kind of encourage those behaviors, they're going to continue to jump off of the stairs, right? So that's kind of something that I let parents know too, you know, like, hey, you don't have to praise it, but if you don't praise it, they're going to keep jumping and that's going to continue to be an issue, right? Um, but praise can be said in terms of, you know, I really like the way that you're sitting quietly. You know, thank you for being so patient. Um, if you have the kiddos with ADHD that are the ones that are like interrupting the conversation a lot, right? Thank you for taking your turn. I really appreciate it when, you know, we have this nice conversation. So really focusing in on what you as a parent want with the praise. Now, um, we have a, a mom, Karina, who said something that I, I would really want to highlight and get your perspective on. Uh, she says, I feel like the, when the consequences are set with my child and I follow through, a lot of times it gets worse. They get upset when Karina holds them to these consequences. They start yelling. They start hitting. What can she do? So that's the prime example that we say it gets worse before it gets better. Um, Sorry. Sorry. Gonna yeah, chances are it's going to be like that for about, um, let's say, two to three consequences. Um, it's just a matter of consistency. So let's say um, I'll give an example that I've seen with um, parent not wanting child to be on their phone as much texting. Child continued to do it. Parent had to remove um, like they cut their phone, essentially the phone bill. So then child found a way to bring it on campus, use Wi-Fi or use Wi-Fi at friend's house. So then parent had to take the entire phone away, right? Yeah. And the child was acting out, sneaking out. So the behavior did get worse. It got worse by a lot. But after a certain point, child kind of figured out that no matter what I do, I'm going to get in trouble regardless. So they just kind of gave up. And when they gave up, their grades actually started getting a lot better. Um, so then parent was able to come back and say, you know, like, I really like the way that your grades are coming together. And I want to kind of do a contract with you. If your grades continue to be this way, then we could revisit the consequence of the phone. But at that point, like the behavior had gotten so much worse to the point where student was sneaking out um, at night. But parent did have to like be really firm. And it's also really hard on parents, right? Again, as a therapist, I don't just see the child. I also see the parent and I get to hear a lot of the struggles that you guys go through. Um, and it really is like frustrating because as a therapist, I also see the frustration in the child in my office. And then I like see where you guys are coming from. But in that sense, um, if you are like co-parenting or you have other support systems, let them know what you're doing as well so that they could also support you in that moment. So, for example, if you have a partner that you're raising your child with, let them know, hey, they have a consequence. They didn't follow through. If you could help me out with the consequence, that would be great. Or if you guys have support from, let's say, like extended family members, grandmas, grandpas, um, aunts, cousins, anything. Also let them know, hey, you know, if you hear them kind of complaining about this let them know that it's a consequence and maybe you explain it to them right so really honing in on that support system for yourselves as a parent 
Thanks. Uh, so again, in terms of reward systems, um, for the younger kiddos too, like the little stars kind of sheet really work, especially if you let them pick out the sticker sheets that they really like. Um, and then just kind of give them the option, hey, you know, once you get to a certain amount, you could kind of redeem for a reward what you want to do. For the older kiddos, typically contracts work a little bit better in terms of saying, if you're able to do this and this during the week, then you're granted permission to do or to go out or to have your favorite food. Um, but this is typically a way that works really well, especially for like neurodivergent. So kids on the spectrum, kids with ADHD um, or anything that might be kind of a little difficult to concentrate up here. So just some tips for creating a reward system. Just start really slow. Um, you know, choose a very low limit. So for example, if you want your kids to do more chores, set a very low limit. Give them like two chores during the week, right? And just let them really focus on that to just start to build that routine. In terms of homework, again, set a low limit. I want you to sit down for 30 minutes and do your homework. If you don't, there is a consequence. I want you to let you, and, you, and also do a timer. If you're doing a time-based consequence, do a timer so that they could hear it. So that they're not like, you are doing whatever you want to do. No, you heard the timer. I don't control time. That's your consequence, right? Um, again, desired behavior should be very defined. I want you to be calm. I want you to be cautious. And then they start jumping and doing all these things. You ignore it when they sit down. Thank you for being so calm. Thank you for being so patient, right? And then uh, reward now. So um, remember, former skeptic, former non-believer here. Um, I also know that those rewards, uh, when the child in, the, in your example does sit down, that sticker or that positive reinforcement should come instantly or as soon as you can make it, right? Just so that the child knows to match your um, positive reinforcement to the behavior that they just engaged in. Yeah, so for example, if child is fighting with sibling and then they calm down, give a reward. Thank you for calming down and thank you for being so nice, right? So that would be like automatically what you expect them to be or what you expect them to do. So it's just reinforcing like, oh, so instead of saying my parents are going to care about me when I jump off the stairs, now you're, they're saying, oh, my parents really care about me when I'm like really nice to my sibling. Hmm. So they start to do it a lot more because that's the way that they're going to get your attention and your validation. Um, a really important one, though, tokens or awards should not be taken away. The reason why we do this is because when you give them their token or their sticker or their award, you're telling them you earned this. So when you take it away, you're kind of taking away their illusion of choice. So again, as parent, we have control. You're taking away their illusion of control. So you're kind of sending the message of you worked really hard for this and I'm taking it from you. And that doesn't really sit well with kids, especially if they have a lot going on right here already and they already feel tired and they already feel really confused on why the world doesn't operate to their standard. So taking that away is going to make them feel worse. So if anything, just say, you know, I really don't appreciate that. Let's see how that's going to play out tomorrow, right? And then if anything, just don't take anything away once it's given. If it's consequence, you could give it away. But once you give it to them, don't just like take it away. So again, um, just building collaboration. So I actually touched on this a little bit earlier, right? If you are a parent and you're kind of struggling with going through this, you feel like they're not listening, they're not paying attention to you, really hone in on who is around you that could really help support you as the parent. Because as the parent, this is also really stressful. And it's also really hard to have to change the way you talk and the way you kind of operate with your kids. So just kind of, you know, see who you could check in with, see who, who could help you, see who you could practice with as well. Um, if you have pets, you could actually practice with your pets, funny enough, and you could kind of give them rewards like, thank you for sitting down. Oh, thank you for meowing so quietly, right? Or thank you for like um, being so happy to see me. So you could practice with your pets beforehand. And more than anything, it is going to, the behavior will probably get worse once you start doing these things before it gets better. So it's just a matter of patience, right? So really tap into, as a parent, what could you do that makes you calm down, that makes you relax a little bit when going through these hard times with your child? So this is just some examples of some of the point systems. You guys don't have to use these, but again, desired behaviors, right? 
Um, for like the little ones, gentle hands, using your words. Again, in therapy, we teach a lot of I statements. So when kids are frustrated, instead of punching something, right, the I statements are to counterbalance that. So instead of hitting something because you're angry, you go, I'm really angry. So we start to teach kids that in the therapy room so that they don't go based on behavior. They could vocalize what they feel in the moment. Ines, we have a, a, an interesting question from Tanisha. Does this reward system work for younger kids only? Or is there a difference uh, between reward system for younger kids and a uh, 16-year-old? Yeah, so for the older kids specifically, because they kind of want to be a little bit more independent, depending on like their age range or like their interest. So for example, if you have a 16-year-old who let's say is very involved in like online gaming, right? A reward system would be kind of based on, let's say they build their computers, they build, or they're very just into that niche community. Um, reward system could be based on, you know, if you do certain things within the next month, within, you know, whatever time, um, I'll give you some funds so you could start saving up for a keyboard, right? Or something based on their interest. If there's someone who's very social and they like to go out, they like to go to Target with their friends, right? You know, if you do this during the week um, in a timely manner, then I'll let you pick one outing with your friends during the weekend, right? So just really looking at what kind of rewards are they asking for or what kind of things do they take interest in? So if it's someone who likes to go outside, okay, you need to do this so that you could get your your one day outside. If there's someone who's into video games, into uh, like anime shows, anything, okay, how can I support you in this? But like not flat out buying you like a $300 keyboard, I'll give you like $20 a week, right? And then you save up for a type of thing. So little things like that. Um, but with teens, just kind of working around their interest. Um, this is a behavior chart. I typically don't use it in therapy because I don't see the child every day. But as a parent, it might be something nice to kind of use, looking at some goals, kind of tracking behavior. It's but... also very visual for the child to see whether they met their goal or not. Um, mm -hmm. So they can even learn that skill of self-regulation. It's a good, good suggestion. Thank you. Yeah, these are also nice to just have posted on the fridge. The fridge is where everyone tends to just kind of hang around for some reason. So in terms of a family setting, these are really nice to have. Yeah. Um, for example, bathroom, mirror, fridge are the most common areas. Oh, this is beautiful. Thank you for bringing this up, uh, Ines. Uh, if you don't mind, Ines, I'd like to speak yeah, go for it. from the school district perspective. Um, as parents, you may or may not know, uh, we do have a dynamic, um, really um, extensive um, set of services and uh, accommodations and modifications that our uh, teachers and schools provide through special education services. Um, and even general education services throughout our district. One of those is an IEP. It's an individualized education program. Uh, IEPs are very specific to that particular child. In order to qualify for an IEP, there are a lot of um, factors that need to be present in the particular uh, child. They go through a pretty extensive evaluation. It's not something that is just kind of, you know, provided like, I think my child needs an IEP. Great, and then there would be, um, generally what happens is there is a pre, um, sort of a period of analysis, data analysis that the teachers get into, that's the um, school psychologists might get into, the principal and counselors get into, uh, and they do um, interventions and they try things out in the um, students' schooling to see if there's something that can be mitigated or fixed without having to go through the extensive IEP process. And then that's called generally an SST. Um, you go through that and then you see, did this work or is there something else that's needed? So IEP is definitely something that um, is part of special, special education. You have to qualify for that. If you're interested in more information about that, please reach out to your child's uh, principal for that. And then a 504 plan is, um, without getting too uh, much into, into the weeds and into the technicalities of it, generally a student needs to have either a physical or a mental uh, disability that prevents them from being successful or performing a major life activity. Um, and so again, through 
the process of you thinking, ah, I think my child might need a 504, they might need an IEP, um, please reach out to your child's uh, principal, their teacher, say, hey, I, this is what I'm seeing, can we get into, and I, generally the first thing that happens is you go through the SST process, and through the SST process, the, the teacher and the counselor and the principal, they do go into um, um, implementing um, accommodations and changes for the child and interventions for the child and seeing if those are successful. And if they're successful, then, you know, the child doesn't need to go through anything else. Um, but if they're not, then there's, you know, more investigation that's needed. Thank you, Ines. Cool. We are going to go over some quick myths and facts really quickly. So starting off, there is this myth, a common misconception that ADHD is caused by poor parenting, right? Not by poor parenting. However, it can be caused by genetics. So again, ADHD tends to run in families. We tend to see that it is a gene inherited. Usually if a child does have an ADHD um, diagnosis, chances are someone in the family is going to go, oh, that makes so much sense. Their brother, cousin, sister, aunt, mom is exactly like that. Um, from a therapy perspective, that's when we kind of go, oh, okay, got it. So it runs in the family. The other myth is ADHD is being overdiagnosed. So again, because the assessment process similar to the IEP revolves around having multiple inputs, meaning you have to consult with the parent, you have to consult with the teacher, you have to consult with the therapist. Chances are sometimes with an IEP, you also have to consult with the principal, right? So the similar way that you have to have for three to four different inputs of people is the same way that ADHD gets diagnosed. So it is a little bit of a harder diagnosis to get because of that, because three to four people have to be in agreement that yes, there is a disturbance in all three locations, in the home, at school, um, in the office, or maybe their place of sport, wherever. The other myth, brain imaging can diagnose ADHD. Um, about this one, again, because the neurons, the neurons are completely working. The brain is communicating. It's just not going to the location it needs to go. It's kind of visiting its friends, right? So it's like, oh, I wonder what hearing is doing. And I wonder what my vision is doing. So brain imaging actually cannot pick up ADHD brain because it is a normal functioning brain. It just likes to visit all of its friends at the same time instead of doing what it's supposed to do, right? Thank you so, for making neurobiology very accessible, even for, because I'm like, I, I don't understand neurobiology in the brain, but you're, you made it into like little people that it's like, okay, thinking needs to do this task, but it's going off and going to visit his friend. I'm, I'm kind of picturing like uh, inside out. So that, that does make it accessible. Thank you. Yeah. It's like visiting its neighbors, its cousins, its family, its friends. It's just going everywhere except where it needs to be. So that's kind of the way ADHD brain works. It still works. That's the key element, just not in the way that people are used to seeing it work. The other myth is that only young boys get ADHD. And while this is a fact, it's not a fact that only they get it. It's a fact that they tend to see their diagnosis a lot more. Because again, boys are socialized to be active and to be in sports and to kind of wrestle each other. Where girls are more socialized to be calm to sit down, to interact with one another, take turns talking, and really building that social connection. So girls can actually have ADHD. It just gets more diagnosed amongst men and boys because in the, in the society that we live in, they're kind of expected to be a little bit impulsive, a little bit athletic, a little bit kind of like, what was I supposed to do? I'm pretty sure you guys know of teenage boys where you tell them, hey, can you go into the fridge and get me like a cup of milk? And they go to the fridge and they're like, I don't see it. And it's right there in front of them. So again, ADHD tends to be diagnosed a little bit more with boys because of these things where girls are more likely to just kind of move things. And here you go. Boys will kind of stare at it and be like, I don't see it. So another myth is that sugar causes ADHD. Um, sugar consumption does not have any links to ADHD. It does have links to other things like cortisol or not cortisol, um, cholesterol and just more health related things, diabetes. But nothing really with ADHD. Um, it will have a effect if the child already has ADHD and maybe it spikes their insulin levels, but it's not going to cause it in the child. Um, the other myth is that no one really needs medication for ADHD, which 
fact, but also myth. So for people who are very high on the ADHD spectrum, again, if their brain is not really, their, if their brain is too busy visiting neighbors to the point where it can't get normal functioning done, it's forgetting to brush its teeth in the morning, put on its shoes, grab its backpack. Based on parents and their guidance, they could see medication as a good fit, but it's not fully needed. Another myth is that ADHD is addictive. So ADHD medication is prescribed by someone who, a doctor, right, is monitoring the effects of the medication and they're actually making changes to it if necessary. Um, the reason why people have said ADHD medication has been um, addictive in the past is because people tend to use the medication for other substances. So for example, we would see it on college campuses for the most part in terms of kids selling their Adderall to other students for the sake of like studying quicker, um, different things like that. So for an ADHD brain on medication, it's not addictive, but for a non-ADHD brain on medication, it could potentially be um, a risk factor. Another myth is that people with ADHD are lazy and irresponsible, and that's not the truth, to be honest. Um, oftentimes they're set up in classroom settings or in places where, again, their brain is not operating the way that the normal society would like it to operate, right? So I see it very specifically in the way that I see my ADHD students actually have to put in double the amount of work in order to concentrate at the same level of their classmates because they are struggling to concentrate and they're also struggling to repress a lot of their internal voices and they're really struggling to kind of have to fight the fact that their brain is visiting friends and then they feel bad about it and then they're like oh I feel like I can't get anything done I feel worthless I feel guilty right so they're not lazy or irresponsible it's actually a lot for them as well so again looking at techniques like some of the reward systems kind of managing um, if as a parent medication is needed in the future having that conversation with the child or kind of seeking your own values as a parent and saying, hmm, is this going to work? Is this not going to work? Um, also working with the school in terms of the IEPs, right? How can my student get a little bit more specialized time? Can my student see like a counselor during the school time to really kind of help some of the behaviors? So really using like those holistic approaches if medication is a hard no. Yep. And we do have um, a lot of different supports, both in the district. And then also we, we have... Um, partnerships with different organizations. I mean, you're kind of experiencing a partnership that we have now with Riverside County Office of Ed and Ines's office. Ines, uh, I have a, a really interesting question that was brought up by Melissa. If, uh, if one child of mine has ADHD, does that mean their sibling can have it as well? They can, but I've also had cases where only one child out of three has ADHD. So it's, again, it's very dependent on the genetics of the children um, and also their environment. So if one child was born in like a high stress environment, maybe they got it. And if the other children kind of came in at a later time where maybe there was more resources, it wasn't as stressful, chances are maybe they might not have it. Interesting. Thank you. So another myth is that there's no accommodations for ADHD in school or workplace. This is not true. There is a federal law that protects um individuals with ADHD specifically, as well as individuals with uh, disabilities, both in educational and workplace settings. Um, so for example, if your child does go off to college, um, the Disabilities Act will in be enacted during their time at undergrad or college. So for example, it'll give them like 15 extra minutes of testing, access to record lectures, things like that. So they are protected. Yeah, and I think that's something that a lot of even college students don't know about. I was a, a lab instructor at Cal State San Bernardino, and I had a um, student come to me and say, Professor, here are the accommodations that I need uh, for the class in order to be successful. And as his uh, professor at that time, I had to follow those. Um, and that's something that um, is interesting um, and something important to highlight for our families that once um, you know these services are available and you know they're qualified for and all that, they follow the child whether they go from one school to another, one district to another. So these are very uh, impactful. But again, um, IEPs, 504s, all of these—they're not something to be 
taken lightly or request lightly. They are a very extensive process that you have to qualify for. Uh, and then the child gets kind of monitored and tracked throughout uh, the, the time. And the goal is to be able to build up their skills in order to, um, you know, depending on the child, have it so that they don't, they no longer need the, the services. But that is, you know, very child specific. And then for the last myth that I'll be covering, right, my child's life will not be normal because of ADHD. And that's not true. So oftentimes my kiddos with ADHD in the counseling session have a lot of really interesting strengths in their character, right? They're really quick thinkers. They're great multitaskers. They're also really empathetic because they know what it's like to feel misunderstood. So they're quick to understand other people when they feel really down or upset. So individuals with ADHD can experience a really good quality of life. It's just a matter of learning how to do some parent interventions, learning how to kind of change the dynamic for that specific child in a way that really benefits them and their personal strengths. Um, and also looking at possible treatments, either through uh, psychotherapy, through medication, or through just counseling um, for the individual or kind of like the family as a whole. But overall, it's a really cool life. And it is a, a field that's growing in terms of research for ADHD. Um, it is really new, and I think as clinicians as well, we try our best not to just diagnose ADHD, but really work with the parent, really see what's going on, um, as well as with the kiddo, just to see kind of where they are in life, what they want to do, and how we can also help to manage everything. And yeah, more than anything as well, parents, I understand it's like really hard. Um, I also see other parents' frustrations in the office and just how difficult it is to kind of like what you guys say, like, how do I ignore my child when they're kind of risking themselves by jumping off the stairs, right? But ultimately, again, these children tend to grow up and be very grateful for the quality of life that they have and the accommodations that as a parent, we're often willing to do to really give them that quality of life. Um, you know, Ines, you just said something that I think I'm just gonna sign off all of our meetings are. He said, at the end of the day, it's a really cool life. That is, that's funny. I like that a lot. Um, since we're on the topic of uh, ADHD, uh, what I'd like to do is I'd like to provide our families with this invitation. This is a webinar. Excuse me. Nope, it's not a webinar. This is a workshop that we will be having next Friday. It's in person. It won't be uh, virtual, although we're maybe um, going to see if we can do a hybrid. So if you're not able to meet with us in person, it, it'll be at Arlanza Elementary School. You don't have to be a parent of a student in Arlanza to uh, join us. It's open to all of our district parents. And it is the signs of symptoms and support for ADHD. And it'll be a, a conversation with a, a medical doctor, a P, uh, MD, PhD, Dr. Jennifer Zamora. She's from uh, UC Riverside uh, School of Medicine. Um, so she will be there to talk from not a mental health necessarily perspective as our, our therapy perspective here with Ines. Thank you so much, Ines. But she's going to be talking more on the uh, physical uh, health uh, aspect. So parents, um, this will be in your parents square soon. If it's not already, I don't remember, um, but I'll, I'll send it out as a reminder for you all to uh, join us. We hope to see you there. Um, and then I know that we have a, um, a lot of parents who probably still have a lot of uh, questions. We are uh, past our time, so I want to respect Yvonne's time, our interpreter. Ines, thank you so much for, um, for this presentation. Ines and I have been working closely, parents, to get you some really good um, webinars and discussions for next semester. Um, we do have one that uh, says in the future, can we get a meeting on children with dyslexia? I think that's a fantastic idea. Um, families, if you have uh, more specific questions and you want more specific support, there's a couple of things that I would recommend. First, I would say to reach out to your child's teacher, child's principal, counselor, um, for what supports your child can get in their school. But then if you families, you feel like I might need therapy for myself, I might need mental health support for myself. That's something that our office um, here at, um, we have family engagement, but then also community schools team. I see uh, we have Miss Sikairos uh, with us. She is one of our fantastic community workers who is able to 
um, marshal resources uh, for our families. So uh, if you have uh, a need, I think what Ms. Um, Ms. Uh, Ines said is true, is you are not alone. And Ines, we're getting a lot of um, kudos and shout outs in the chat. Thank you, parents. If there's something else that you would like to see or a conversation you'd like us to bring, um, please feel free to send me an email, send me a text. I've put somewhere in the chat um, my email and phone number, um, but you can just look me up on the averageschools.org webpage. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a good night. Bye. And thank you, Yvonne. Thank you so much. Bye.